Hopkins computed doses for populations based on estimates of average volume and types of food consumed and time spent outdoors. Information derived from asking people about their consumption and daily practices in the past. Once they had a dose reconstruction, an estimate of, do of the doses people probably received, they then calculated how those doses affected health by extrapolating health consequences, consequences from Hiroshima to Chernobyl. The substitution treated the large external gamma X-ray dose at Hiroshima as a universal exposure comparable to, to the slow, low-level internal exposures of Chernobyl survivors. But Chernobyl doses, Belarusian scientists protested, differed greatly from those of bomb survivors. Much of the danger, they informed visiting IAEA scientists, came not from external gamma rays, but from ingested radioactive isotopes, some in the form of inhaled hot particles, hot particles which are fuel fragments, nano-sized particle, nano-sized uh, fuel fragments, which they estimated caused damage at several times lower doses than external exposures. And you can see this in the film. They are demanding that there is no difference between internal exposures and external exposures. They're both the same, which now we know they aren't. Because we have to, for effective dose, we have to add those, those, um, those rating factors. For alpha, it's 20. For neutron, it's 10, and for beta and gamma, it's 1, okay? <laughs> the IAEA researchers, they pointed out, took as fact statements by Moscow officials that all people in contaminated areas ate clean food shipped in from elsewhere. Really? Right. As Belarusian researchers had already found, corpses in relatively clean Vibinsk uh, province showed nearly the same levels and of incorporated radioactivity as those corpses in the contaminated provinces of southern Belarus because food products in the circulation were radioactive. Belarusian scientists puzzled over what kind of results the UN study of a small sample of 1,600 people would deliver. According to charts from the Japanese lifespan study, the protocol for the Chernobyl study would find only catastrophic health results not the wide range of acute and subacute health problems they had reported in studies carried out by Bel in Belarus. While UN teams performed thyroid uh, exams on children selected for their case control study, Soviet doctors handed to the IAEA consultants biopsies of an unexpectedly large number of children with thyroid cancer, 20 to 30 times higher than usual. That indeed was a catastrophic result. UN researchers doubted the cancers could be real. The doses were too low compared to Hiroshima. Hiroshima, they kept repeating. The cancers came too soon. The latency, latency period was from 5 to 10 years. Four years after the accident, they calculated, was too early to see cancers, even among children, whose cells multiply quickly. That's why children are, are susceptible and in more danger. Soviet researchers in Ukraine and Belarus were confused. They did not hold the Japanese lifespan study as their gold standard. They hardly knew that material. Instead of computing doses and consequences, Soviet researchers encouraged visiting experts to use patients' bodies and bodily material evidence such as biopsies to determine both doses and damage. But that wasn't how radiation epi epidemiology was done in the West, the United States. Okay. Health physicists were operating on the understanding that if high doses from the atomic bombs caused some damage to the population of bomb survivors, much lower Chernobyl doses would deliver far lower rates of illnesses. Increases of cancers so minimal, they computated, computated they would be impossible to de detect above the average cancer rates. Do you guys understand how this works? This is still true today. I have discussions with a professor where he's not understanding this, this fact of internal exposures and external gamma rays or x-rays. In fact, with the lifespan study as a referent and an estimate of ambient radiation levels, Western researchers did not need to do a study. Doses were so low, they concluded they would find no effects. <laughs> A study done so soon after exposure would produce little useful knowledge. So why do one at all? 
Clarence Washball, a doctor with the Atomic Energy Commission, funded Oak Ridge Associated Universities, wrote privately to a colleague in 1980, admitting that these kinds of low-dose radiation studies were largely for public consumption. Both nuclear workers and their management need to be assured that the carrier involvement exposures to low levels of nuclear radiation is not hazardous to one's health. Do you see that? If, if even the workers know about it, they're worried that the workers won't even work. The results of such a study of American nuclear workers could be the best countermeasure to the anti-nuclear propaganda that continues to flood all of us. It would be immensely, immensely useful in resolving workmen's claims. It fell to the Department of Energy, the successor to the Atomic Energy Commission, to fund these studies, Lushball continued, because if competitors such as the Nuclear Workers Labor Union, Union did their own studies, they could come up with damning results. Results. A study designed to show the transgressions of management will usually succeed, Lushball was pointing to the fact that the parameters of dose reconstructions were so flexible that they could easily serve political purposes. The IAEA served up a study just like the one Lushball proposed, one designed to placate anxious publics in, publics in the Soviet Union, Europe, and North America. The short 18-month examination concluded in the rushed publication of the International Chernobyl Project final report in spring of 1991. The report estimated that the rates of disease, though higher than expected, were the same in both the control and in the exposed groups. They attributed the excess of health problems to stress caused by the exposure of radiation, or what scientists call radiophobia. The only health outcome you investor, investigators saw was the possible detectable future bump in childhood thyroid cancer. What of the thyroid cancers that had already appeared, Belarusian and Ukraine researchers asked. What about the biopsies they gave the UN teams to verify? In the transcripts of the 1991 meeting on the International Chernobyl Project report, Mettler acknowledged that he had taken the biopsies home to his lab in New Mexico and they had checked out. Despite the fact, the final reporter's text stated that only there had been rumors of pediatric thyroid cancer that were anecdotal in nature. The UN consultants had verified a major 20-fold increase in pediatric thy thyroid cancer in a university lab and then called that proof anecdotal. Why did they do that? Why did they do that? The UN consultants were volunteers. They worked at universities or government labs. They were independent of the UN, UN hierarchy, beholden to no one. Perhaps the health physicists denied evidence they had themselves verified because it did not match their predictive models from the Japanese lifespan study. Do you guys understand that? This could be a case of slow science where it takes a long time for researchers to shift from one paradigm to another. But there is more to the story. The Japanese lifespan study was in the open literature, but it was far from the only research into human exposures to radioactive contaminants. Researchers on the UN team who had security clearances had access to classified studies that showed that 79% 70, of children in the Marshall Islands exposed to American bomb blast under the age of 10 had developed thyroid cancer. 79% of several hundred children had thyroid cancer when the background rate was one in a million. One in a million, guys. That was a clear precedent against which the judge, which to judge the Chernobyl cancers. In 1991, however, the Marshall Island studies were still classified. So too was the vast work the U.S. government had commissioned related to radi radiation experiments on the human subjects. Researchers with high-level clearances had known for decades about swift-moving pediatric thyroid cancers and contaminated landscapes, but they could not discuss them in public. Guess what's on the rise, people? Thyroid cancer. You guys know thyroid cancer right now is on the rise, especially on the west coast of the U.S. The Chernobyl case is not merely a matter of...